We extend a warm welcome to you all to our morning worship from Partick in the West End of Glasgow. We shall now begin the public worship of God by singing from Psalm 145, 145, the second version, from verse 1 of the second version of Psalm 145. O Lord, thou art my God and King, thee will I magnify and praise. I will thee bless and gladly sing unto thy holy name always. Each day I rise, I will thee bless and praise thy name time without end. Much to be praised and great God is, his greatness none can comprehend. We're going to sing to verse 8, six stanzas from Psalm 145. The second version from verse 1, O Lord, thou art my God and King. O Lord, thou art my God and King. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Let us pray. O Lord our God, the one true and living God, that one who is from everlasting to everlasting, who alone is eternal, without beginning nor end, who alone is God, who dwells in light unapproachable. We thank thee, O Lord, that this morning that we can come into thy glorious presence, not because of who we are, not because of what we have done or will do, but because of our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has secured access to the very holy of holies itself, to heaven, where God resides. And there, O Lord, our intercessor, our advocate, there sits upon the throne of the universe. And we are accepted in the Beloved because of his life, because of his sufferings, death, and resurrection. And we bless thee, O Lord, for his ascension and for his exaltation at thy right hand. We thank thee indeed for this all-powerful, all-sufficient, and all-willing Savior. And, O Lord, we do pray that as we gather in his name on this the Lord's day, the day that reminds us of the glorious resurrection and of the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Lord, we ask that as we gather in his name, that our minds, our thoughts, our emotions might gravitate to where he is today. Set your affections on things above and not upon the things of this earth. And we do realize and do confess before thee that there are many occasions when we come to occasions like this and we bring all kinds of mental baggage with us. Our minds are taken up with homes, with families, with finances, with food, with other things of this world, and we fail to give due consideration to the salvation of our never-dying eternal souls. We never really think about that world that is to come, that eternal world, where we are but our last breath away from it, when we shall be taken into eternity. O oh Lord, we do thank Thee that Thy Word leads us and guides us. Thy Word is God's revelation to mankind. And in thy word thou dost tell us about the beginning of this world, about our creation, about our account accountability, for we are made in the image of God. It reminds us, O Lord, of our purpose, for man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And O Lord, we thank thee that in the scriptures we find God's way whereby we can be reconciled to God. And having been reconciled to God, we're able to live a life that is pleasing to him. And uh, as a result at the end, we shall be brought into glory, where nothing impure shall enter in but those who have been sanctified and those who are joined by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us, therefore, O Lord, we ask for our time that we're gathered here. We pray that thou would pour out upon us thy spirit. We ask that we might be quickened and awakened. We pray that our minds would, in a very real sense, be emptied of the things of time. And for the short period that we're here, Lord, enable us to meditate profitably upon that world that is to come. We commend all who are here. We remember every soul, and we cast ourselves before thee, and we pray that thou might remember us, and that all of us might know the blessing that the Lord gives, and addeth no sorrow with it. We do pray that none of us will be left in a state of nature Instead, O Lord, we ask that that gracious, sovereign work of God 
might truly have begun in us and that we would know the Lord working in us, in our lives, transforming us and making us more and more <coughs> like the Savior. So remember us as homes, as families. Bless us, we pray thee. Leave us not unto ourselves. We do pray that thou would bless the witness of this congregation. We do pray that the word of God might be continued to be proclaimed here and that that word would bear fruit. We ask, O Lord, that thou would draw others to this place of worship where they might hear to their prophet the things of God and where they might hear that their souls might live. So remember our homes and families, our husbands, wives, sons, daughters, grandchildren, <coughs> siblings, parents. We remember all our loved ones before thee. We do pray that thou bless the cause of Christ in the day that we find ourselves ministering in. We remember the brethren who are absent today, preaching elsewhere. We remember Alistair MacLeod Mayer, and we think of him in Edinburgh, and we pray that he would know the help and the liberty of thy spirit, and that it might be a blessing to himself and a blessing to the congregation. Be with William MacLeod and Stornoway. We commend him there likewise, that he would know the blessing that God alone gives and that the congregation might be encouraged. And we do remember the vacant congregations, O Lord, that thou would be pleased to uphold them and sustain them <coughs> and undertake for them and keep them faithful and united during the time of vacancy. We think of our locality and our city and our nation and we pray for its peace and for its prosperity. And we do ask, O Lord, that we might live in days when the gospel might be freely proclaimed, that there would be no restrictions upon the authentic preaching of thy word. And although we do believe that successive governments are determined to silence the church and they are determined to set out what can and what cannot be said. O oh Lord, give us boldness, give us clarity. Give us that desire whereby we might proclaim what we find in the Bible without fear. And O oh Lord, we look unto thee for the results to follow. Remember those who lead and govern over us, we think of our first minister and his cabinet. We commend him to thee. And we pray ultimately for their salvation, that they might be saved from their sins and that they would embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Likewise, we remember our prime minister and his cabinet and we commend them likewise to thee. And we do ask that thou might give us leaders who rule in righteousness, who rule under the fear of God. Raise up men, we pray thee, like Joseph and Daniel and David. O oh Lord, remember us, look upon us and see our pitiful condition. Hear our prayers, therefore we ask, and be with us now, and may all things redound to thy glory, and overlook our sins, even as we stand here, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We shall now sing from Psalm 34, beginning at verse 1. Psalm 34, God will I bless all times, his praise my mouth shall still express. My soul shall boast in God, the meek shall hear with joyfulness. 
Extol the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, he heard, and did me from all fears deliver. And we'll sing to verse 9 of this psalm, psalm number 34, verses 1 to 9. God will I bless all times. God will I bless all times his praise. My mouth shall still express. My soul shall boast in God. The ring shall hear with joy come from Mark's Gospel and from chapter 10. The Gospel according to Mark. And we shall read a portion of this chapter. And we shall begin at verse 1 of Mark chapter 10. Let us read and hear God's Word. And he arose from thence, and cometh into the coast of Judea, by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again, and, as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him, and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement, and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. 
And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife, and marry another, committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband, and be married to another, she committeth adultery. And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, and kneeled to him, and asked him, Good master, what shall I do, that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. <clears throat> thou knowest the commandments, Do not commit adultery, Do not kill, Do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And so on. Amen. And may the Lord follow with his blessing upon the public reading of his own word. Singing now from Psalm 19, from verse 7. Psalm 19 from verse 7. <clears throat> God's law is perfect and converts the soul in sin that lies. God's testimony is most sure and makes the simple wise. The statutes of the Lord are right and do rejoice the heart. The Lord's command is pure and doth light to the eyes impart. Down to verse 11. Psalm 19 verses 7. 2.11, God's law is perfect. God's law is perfect and convert a soul in sin that lies. God's testimony <coughs> Fine. 
second reading this morning comes from Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, and we shall read together a portion of chapter 3. Paul's letter to the Philippians, and reading from chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Let us read and hear the word of the Lord. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And so on. Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless to us the public reading of his own infallible word. We want to choose our text this morning from that portion of scripture that we have just read. From Philippians chapter 3, and verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 shall be our text. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And the title I want to give to the meditation this morning, All for Christ, all for Christ. And as we look at this, seeking the Lord's blessing that he might bless our meditation upon it, I do want you to bear in mind the reading that we read from Mark's Gospel, particularly the rich young ruler. And we want to see, as we go through this, the contrast between the Apostle Paul and the rich young ruler. What do we have here in these verses? Well, or in our text at least, we have Paul is acknowledging all the benefits of his upbringing and background, but he considers being found in Christ the greatest of all his blessings. He's able to look back at all that he enjoyed 
all the privileges of his upbringing, all the blessings that were his, and there were great blessings, but everything is nothing in comparison with knowing and loving and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore he was prepared to turn his back upon his self-righteousness, because that is what his upbringing brought about in him. There was nothing wrong in his upbringing. Let's be clear about that. But his upbringing, and we'll look at it as we go through it, but his upbringing simply fanned the flames of his self-righteousness. And when he had that glorious, once for all, encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the day of when he was going to Damascus, he saw that his self-righteousness was nothing. It was but dung. And it, it couldn't compare with knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and all the blessings that he has secured for him. So we want to look at this verse in context this morning. All for Christ. He begins an exhortation to rejoice. Now we're inclined to think this is more than likely attached to the previous chapter. And we notice in that chapter, particularly towards the end, the three examples of persons who were Christians who followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is our ultimate example, but here we were presented with Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, ones who modeled them themselves upon the Savior and who were prepared to undertake lots and lots of things in order that others might benefit from their ministry. And basically what he's saying to the Philippians here is, whatever God is doing in your life, whatever it is, you might be like Epaphras, you might be sick or almost unto death, rejoice. You might be like the Apostle Paul, who was under threat of losing his life because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, you are to rejoice. And you might be like Timothy, who has spent himself for the cause of the Philippian church. Never mind, you are to rejoice. And this is something that every Christian is to adopt, every Christian is to follow in this pattern, in this lifestyle, that we are to rejoice. And friends, do we not have something to rejoice about? Surely we do. Surely we have something that the Christian has that no one else has. We have Jesus Christ in all his fullness and all that he has secured for his people. Is this not enough to cause us to rejoice? No matter what might happen to us, no matter our, our circumstances, how much they might be contrary to the word of God or contrary to providence, we are to be ones who rejoice. Paul could, Timothy could, Epaphras could, with all their difficulties. And friends, what we need to realize is that what these people went through and what other Christians went through throughout all the running centuries, we will go through exactly the same. Our experience is not any different to others who have gone before us. Not any different. Or oh, it may well be that we will, not, we will be preserved from martyrdom. Yes, that is true. It's not likely that we will suffer martyrdom for our faith. But as we noticed last week, if that was to come in the providence of God to his people, he would give the grace. He would give the grace in our time of need. Therefore, we are to realize that we may be living in a unique time, but our circumstances, our trials, our temptations, the things that will come upon us, others have gone through it before. And the grace of God is sufficient for his people. And therefore, we are to rise above our circumstances. This is not, friends, talking about a, a stiff upper lip. No, no, no. This is relying upon the Savior. 
This is looking to him. This is drawing from his resources. This is because of our union with Christ that cannot be broken. We're able to encounter things that we would never be able to encounter or endure left to our own resources. Therefore, he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, not in the world, not in our possessions, not in our trials, not in our tribulations, but in the Lord. Christian, here we are. Have you come to the house of God with this mindset to rejoice? This is what is peppered throughout this epistle. It is this theme of rejoicing, and there's no one who should rejoice like a Christian. In verse 2, what does he talk about? He gives us a warning. He gives them a warning. It's a threefold warning. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. He's not talking about three different groups or three different persons. He is describing one group of people and he's using a threefold description. He calls them dogs. In biblical times, dogs were not pets ordinarily. There may have been occasions, but dogs were wild, savage beasts. They would tear a corpse. They would eat it. Is that not what happened in the book of Kings? Jezebel was thrown out of the window and almost by the time she landed, the dogs were surrounding her and they tore her apart. Dogs were savage, almost like wolves, and they went around in packs and you kept away from them. Well, he is describing people here who are false teachers. And false teachers had some impact and influence in the church. And Paul was warning them about them. They are dogs. They're out to destroy. And that's what the way it is, friends, when we're surrounded by false teaching, by people who want to draw us away from the simplicity that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what principally were they teaching? They were basically teaching what we call the Judaizers. The Judaizers were people who followed the Apostle Paul virtually wherever he went. And they would accept that in order to be saved from your sins, you must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, they would agree with the Apostle Paul on that statement. You must believe upon the Lord Jesus. But here's the difference, and it's a very significant dis difference, and it takes away the gospel. It's another gospel. They would add, but you must also obey the law of Moses. And particularly, you must be circumcised. In other words, you must become a Jew. You must live like a Jew. It's not enough to simply believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You must obey the ceremonial law, the law that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. And you must be circumcised. Now, that's no gospel at all. If you add to the gospel, you destroy the gospel. If you take away from the gospel, you destroy the gospel. That's not it. And that's why he uses very strong words here. Beware of dogs. And that warning, friends, is apt and appropriate for every time, for every age of the church. We may not be affected by people like that who are telling us that we must obey the law of Moses and we must be circumcised. But there could be teaching us other things and impressing upon us other things. Friends, the gospel is clear. To be saved, you must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. You must look away from yourself. You must look away from your, your past, for your good works, for your religious observance, 
your upbringing or whatever. You cannot rely upon any of these things. You must trust upon Christ and trust upon Christ alone as he is freely offered to you this morning in the gospel. That's what's required. And nothing else. He goes on. He calls them evil workers. These are strong words for the apostle to use concerning people who have infiltrated themselves in the church. He's not talking about people out in the world. He's talking about people in the church. And he's calling them dogs and evil workers. And he says, beware of the concession. That simply means mutilation. They have mutilated themselves. Why? Because they proclaim that you need to be circumcised. Now circumcision had its day. God gave it to Abraham. It was a mark of the covenant. But since the gospel, since the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, circumcision is no longer required. So he warns them. And this warning is apt and appropriate and relevant for us in the 21st century today in our own church. We must be clear. We must have a firm grasp of the simplicity and the profundity of the gospel. And we must fight for its purity and for its clarity. And we must make sure that no one adds to the gospel what is not found in the word of God. But now really to get where we want to be concerning our text. An evaluation he has in verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He is referring to the Philippian Christians, to the genuine Christians. This is what we are. We are... The the circumcision, not the circumcision of the flesh, but the circumcision of the heart. And this is what circumcision always pointed to in the Old Testament. Circumcision was done in the flesh, but it pointed to, it was a figure, it was a shadow of something else. It was pointing to that glorious work of the Spirit when, this, when the heart is cut when the heart is cut by the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes and reveals unto that person their sin, they are cut to the heart. That is what happened to you, Christian. You were circumcised in the heart. Now, as we have said on other occasions, this is not easy to quantify. Before we came, became Christians, we had a realization of our sinfulness, some more than others. Everyone's experience is unique. But this is true of all true Christians. They came to that point in their experience when they recognized they were sinners and they were cut to the heart. They could see that their own self-righteousness could never get them to heaven and they had to rely on another. That's what circumcision pointed to. And those who were circumcised in the Old Testament, if they were truly thinking upon these things, they would see, they would see that it was pointing to that wonderful, invisible, spiritual work of the Holy Spirit. And we are the circumcision we are, he says, not those false teachers who are demanding that you must have physical circumcision. We have spiritual circumcision, which worship God in the spirit. This is what the Christian does. This is what marks out our worship. Many people might think our worship is strange because it's not elaborate. It is very simple. But it's worship in the Spirit. It's worship that God has given to us. And rejoice in Christ Jesus. This is our great hope. 
This is what we delight in. We delight in the person and in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he comes on to his own experience from verses 4 to 7. We have an acknowledgement. He said there towards the end of verse 3, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now he's giving his own personal testimony, how he came to that realization that he has no confidence in his flesh. And what he means by that is he has no confidence in his past experience. And he goes on to outline the blessings and the benefits of his upbringing. Because many of the false teachers, they were trying to rely upon their upbringing, upon their experience. And Paul is saying, well, if they can boast about their experience and their upbringing, so can I. And that's what he does. He was circumcised the eighth day. That's what was required. The male child was circumcised on the eighth day. Abraham wasn't. Ishmael wasn't. Jesus was, and Paul was, exactly according to the law on the eighth day. He goes on. Many of these people, these false teachers, they wouldn't have been circumcised on the eighth day. Many of them would be Gentiles who had been subsequently circumcised in adulthood. He was able to boast, well, I fulfilled the law exactly. I was circumcised on the eighth day. He goes on, of the stock of Israel. Of the stock of Israel. There's something there also that he can boast of. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was circumcised. Isaac begot Jacob and Esau. Both of them were circumcised. What came from Esau? The Edomites. They were circumcised also. But what came from Jacob? Israel came from Jacob. Jacob's name was changed, and it became Israel. And what he's boasting about here is, I didn't come from the Edomites. I didn't come from Esau. My stock was from Israel, from Jacob. That's my stock. That's my pedigree. He is again enlightening the people that they might realize his glorious past and upbringing. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Now the tribe of Benjamin was on many occasions a notable good tribe. On other occasions they were a bad tribe. But from the tribe of Benjamin came the first king, who was King Saul. And no doubt Paul here, who was Saul, he was probably named after the first king of Israel. But why does he say from the tribe of Benjamin? It's very likely that it's because of their association with the temple. The temple was either built on the land of Benjamin or very close to the edge of their land. And also, when the kingdom was divided after the death of Solomon, what happened? Benjamin sided with Judah. The other tribes, they went off and they formed Israel in the northern kingdom. But Benjamin remained faithful to the worship of God, and they sided with Judah. And therefore he is telling them again, look at my pedigree of the tribe of Benjamin. And he goes on, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching a law, as touching the law of Pharisee. Now by the time of the New Testament, the Pharisees hadn't got a very good reputation. 
But when they first were formed during the period between the Old and the New Testaments, the Pharisees generally were upright, morally decent, God-feeding individuals. But like everything else, they started to decline. But initially, friends, they were pure individuals, and they had a real desire to preserve Judaism in its spiritual sense. And therefore he is saying, this is my background, a Pharisee, not a Sadducee who were liberals, not a Herodian who were more concerned about politics, but a Pharisee who loved the scriptures, who loved the word of God, who loved the worship of God. That was my background. And he goes on concerning zeal. What wonderful zeal he had for God. He thought he was serving God when he was persecuting the Christian church. This is what he believed. He believed he was serving God. He had obviously zeal without knowledge, but nevertheless, you cannot deny that he was a zealous individual. Persecute, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law blameless. And therefore he's telling them, as far as the law was concerned, as far as observing the law, as far as Judaism was concerned, he was absolutely blameless. None of those false teachers could ever aspire to this. They could never testify to this. But what does he say in our text? But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. What happened? Well, one day, friends, he was on the road to Damascus. And there he had a commission from the, the high priest to go and round up the Christians in Damascus and to take them back to Jerusalem in order that they might be punished because they believed that Christianity was against the will of God. And there he was, zealous, out and out to destroy Christians and the Christian church. And he met Christ. He had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And instantly there, he saw that all that he was promoting, all was all self-righteousness. And he embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. This man was born again. This man was converted. And this man had a new life. And he was prepared to turn his back upon his old life. Everything that he held dear, everything that was precious to him, he was prepared to embrace Christ and put all his past behind him. Now, his past wasn't wrong. Let's be clear, his past wasn't wrong. But he was relying upon his past. He was relying upon all his good works, all his religion, in order to be saved. He didn't realize that as he, as he was living out the Old Testament life, it should have led him to acknowledge that Jesus Christ was Lord and Savior. Instead, it was Saul and his works that were going to save him. And that's why he turned his back then and he embraced Jesus Christ. But what things were gained to me, he did gain by these things. But he was going to turn now those I counted loss for Christ. You may well wonder then, why did we read Mark chapter 10? Well, we read Mark chapter 10, or at least a portion of it, because we wanted to read about the rich young ruler. You know, the rich young ruler, what was he? Well, he was rich, he was young, he was a ruler. What kind of ruler? He would have been a synagogue ruler. He was a religious man. He was, in some sense, like the Apostle Paul. He probably couldn't be able to say all the things that Saul or Paul enumerated for us here, but he was a religious 
person. And he goes to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Even this religious person, what did he realize? He realized there was something missing. He may have been a ruler. He may have organized the, the services in the, in the synagogue. He may have taken part in the synagogue. We don't know, but he was a religious individual. But he recognized there was something missing in his life. What was it? He didn't have that sense of security. He didn't have the gift of eternal life, and he knew it. And he asked the Lord Jesus, and what a person to ask. He couldn't have asked anyone better. Here was the one who has eternal life before him. To know him is to know eternal life. And he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, you know what happened. Jesus told him about the law. Keep the commandments. Now, Jesus was not telling them, we have to understand this, Jesus was not telling them that you can work your way to heaven. Instead, Jesus was using the law to reveal to this man his sin. Well, Jesus gave him certain commandments that he had to keep as examples. And the man was so full of his self-righteousness, he said, all these commandments I have kept from my youth upwards. All these commandments I've kept. He should have said, all these commandments I have broken. All of them. But he was full of self-righteousness. He didn't recognize his true state. It was then Jesus said to him, sell all you have and give to the poor, and then come and take up the cross and follow me. What was Jesus doing there? Well, Jesus was exposing to him his pet sin. What was it? It was covetousness. He, he was rich, and he wasn't prepared to give up his riches and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. This man instantly, as Jesus told him what to do, he began to reckon up like an accountant in his mind, well, if I give up everything, if I give my goods to the poor, I'll have nothing, but I'll have Jesus Christ. And I'll have eternal life. So he balanced the two things in his mind in a split second. And what did he say? He went away sad because he was not prepared to sell his goods and give the money to the poor. He wanted his goods. He wanted his possessions. He wanted his money more than he wanted eternal life. He, he was completely different from the apostle. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. The rich young ruler wanted to hold on to his pet sin and his possessions rather than have eternal life. It was not all for Christ, for him. It was for the Apostle Paul. Here were two men who came to the crossroads in their life and they took a different direction. And friends, we all come to this point. We all come to this uh, decision. We, we all come to this point when we have to make up our mind where we are, whose we are, who we will serve. The Apostle Paul, he didn't turn his back upon his money, although being a Pharisee, likelihood, he would have been able to earn money. But what he turned his back upon was his self-righteousness. And what does that mean? It means relying on self, relying on our own efforts. He wasn't prepared to do that. He was to give up that for the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 8 goes on, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He did suffer, but he was prepared. He considered it a good bargain. And do count them but done that I may win Christ. 
but dung. That can have a reference to human excrement, or it might be a reference to food, waste over food, whatever, it's refuge. And that's what the way that the Apostle Paul looked upon the things that he had given up in order that he may win Christ. What about you today, friend? What about you? Where do you stand? Is it all for Christ? Or is it half for Christ, half for self? 75% for self, 25% for Christ. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ will have all of you, the whole of you, or none of you. That's the way it is with Christ. If we are to win Christ, we are to win him on his terms. We are to call upon him. We are to follow him wholeheartedly. And we're not to rely upon anything in our background, in our money, in our position, in our education, in our religious activities, whatever. All of these things must be cast aside and we're to be saved by Jesus Christ and Him alone. And friends, what a prize it is to win Christ, to win all the blessings that Christ gives to everyone who will come and take up the cross and be willing to be identified with him. Paul then was all for Christ. That's what he's impressing upon the Philippians. And that's what he's impressing upon us in God's word this day, that all of us might truly be all for Christ. How can this come about? What must I do? You must call upon him. You must receive him. You must submit before him. You must recognize that he is God in the flesh. You must recognize that he is the God-appointed Savior, the one who has come from heaven. Indeed, we might say the only one who has come from heaven in order to save sinners like Saul, who persecuted the church one day and then became the ace preacher of the gospel that he sought to destroy. Such is the power of Christ, and he's not lost that power. He is still transforming lives. But it's only for those who are all for Christ. Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, again, we thank thee for thy word, and we thank thee for the example set before us. But above all, we thank thee for the ultimate example of the Son of God, who came to suffer and die, and to secure the eternal salvation and well-being of all his people. Bless thy word to us now, we ask, and be with us as we seek to conclude in praise for the Redeemer's sake. Amen. We shall conclude by singing from Psalm number 34. From verse 17, Psalm 34, from verse 17. The righteous cry unto the Lord, he unto them gives ear, and they out of their troubles all by him delivered are. The Lord is ever nigh to them that be of broken spirit. To them he safely doth afford that are in heart contrite. Let us sing to the end of the psalm, Psalm 34, at verse 17 to the end, the righteous cry unto the Lord.
The righteous cry unto the Lord. stand for the benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Our intimations are as follows. The Old Paths Book Club will meet after refreshments today. Evening service at 6 p.m. The prayer meeting by Zoom on Monday tomorrow at 7 p.m. And the air communion season draws to a close with the Thanksgiving service tomorrow night, Monday, at 7.30 p.m. And the preacher is the Reverend Callum Smith. Our own prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. The Saturday prayer meeting will be held in Knightswood beginning at 7 p.m. And the service is next Lord's Day at 11 a.m. and again 6 p.m. And because of personal circumstances, we will not have our outreach this week. These are all the intimations, God willing.